I give a very quick introduction to Guy and his work. So thanks for coming. We're very happy to have you here. Um, it's actually, we've been following Guy's work for quite a while as, as Contemporary End, and you had been featured in several print issues and online and so on, because we really appreciate your work <laughs> and your eye and your interest. And um, as you will see when he starts talking about this, this is very much, um, um, yeah, you can delve into Guy's practice, which is always very much concerned with um, the issue of migration and its social implications, um, but also with trying to not be just an outsider, but just going to places, talking to people, to have conversations and exchange, and then um, sort of visualizing them in, in his very specific style in these photographs that you that you see here. And um, this is actually <coughs> the content of an artist book that Guy is still sort of working on. And so he's gonna talk us through this. Um, so the artist book is the photographs, but also very importantly, um, there will be texts that Guy has written. And um, so he will tell you more about that. So also what your part is. <laughs> and um, I think it's a very, beautiful, poetic, and very political at the same time compilation of, of images that you brought um, here. And um, I think for us it made a lot of sense to do that in the context of the Center of Unfinished Business, because of course all these um, um, yeah, questions around migration and the terrible situations that are happening, like for example in Calais, are very much directly connected to those legacies. Um, of colonialism, and so I think you can say much more about this, and so I just stop here, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I'm also very happy to be here. Uh, specifically, uh, I didn't even need the visa this time, so I could just run my way from Belgium and just uh, cross the border, uh, or fly over the border because I came by plane and be here in Germany. Uh, I will first um, uh, go through the, um, the, the project a little bit as I wrote it down, and then uh, we will, uh, uh, I will introduce you to the picture. Um, the other thing is that, as they say, as you have been said, I will need you, uh, because we live in a time where we need each other, and it's very important to be aware of this in our daily life, we need each other, not because um, it absolutely will be great to be together. Sometimes it's also very difficult to be together. And we also have to admit that. So um, I would like to have like two people, uh, or maybe three. The texts are not really long. But if someone might find it long, maybe we have three people to read the, the two texts that are part of this. Uh, little booklet which is part of the publication that you have there on the table where you can see a bit how the the final object will look like uh, so um, it's in English and in French so normally as we're doing it in English because uh, most of the people here probably speak uh, English so uh, if there are two of you who would like to read a fragment of the text uh, this one here and then the other one, I already marked the page, that will be fine. Yeah, okay, good. You have one there for the first text and then uh, uh, anyone else? Ah, yeah, that's good for the, for the second text. Thank you. The, the project actually, I titled it uh, after I came back from Calais, I decided to title the project Love Jungle which is a little um, graffiti that I found on the street when I was uh, in Calais. So um, there is a little quote here with which I start, which is like, um, more than a fact, the sun may be an idea we carry along with us, no matter whether we want, no matter whether we want to, no matter where we want to go. Love Jungle is an installation, it's an exhibition, it's a book um, who comes at a specific moment and who have to deal actually not just with this 
uh, heavy aspect uh, of migration. It's also an aesthetic uh, dream. It's also really um, a kind of uh, idea of thinking about artist practice in the perspective of uh, including daily life or daily issues that we, we deal with. So the, the Calais jungle was some chaotic, was some chaotic, but indeed not just a type of chaos that we always hear about. Um, the, the idea into producing um, an, a piece of art from, from a reality like that is something that I find um, interesting and both tricky in the sense that um, we, there are many things going on around nowadays in, the, in relation to the question of, um, of immigration. And uh, one should always be careful because we're dealing here with, um, with facts, which means there is really life of people that are involved. It's not, um, uh, it's not just, um, uh, um, I don't know, it's, it's not just like um, a holiday moment that we take to, to go and see how uh, um, the Mediterranean Sea can be beautiful when you when you 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 on holiday in Malta or somewhere uh, uh, in Morocco or in Libya back in the days. Uh, because today I wonder if there is any tourist who would love to go in Libya to see how Mediterranean is beautiful there. So the the artist book Dominé l'anonymat. Taming anonymity is a result of a performative approach that I undertook as part of my stay in and around the jungle of Calais. Migration, descent, and transgression have always been characteristic of the living since time immemorial. The jungle of Calais was a city apart until the 24th of October 2016. A city with its place of worship, its bars and cafes, its mafia network, its informal architecture that did not always rib, rid with cows, it also has its inhabitant. So, Domine l'anonyme, or timing anonymity in English, um, is a kind of process for me to put us in the heart and uh, outside or around of the Calais jungle in terms of life that, are, that, that has somehow vanishing by being there. Um, because the process of crossing the Mediterranean is something in which um, those who really manage to marry it somehow, uh, they will never be the same anymore. They will never, they will never experience life um, as you and me who didn't do that. So uh, this artist book comes from an arrangement. Um, I mean, here you, you see, we see in the pages of images, there is this selection of text that I wrote during my time in Calais, um, which involves many different aspects of my proper life, of my proper process as a migrant and that we can discuss about it later. I can also introduce you a bit more how I came in contact or how I started work on this question of migration back uh, in the days since 2005, but we can discuss that later if you have a specific question in relation to that. So I will just uh, hold on, I'll stop now, and we will have the first text, and uh, I will go through the, through the book. Thank you. During the conversation we had today, I noticed you seemed not to know that, to know what I will be doing during my stay in Calais. I understand you, and this is why I am letting you know here, in a few words, what I intend to do. So I have hope that you will understand why I have been investing so much energy 
in this project since I went to Malta in 2010. On the issue of immigration, there are both inner and outer sides. It is the same with life. If we focus too much on our inner selves, it may become impossible for us to express our experiences in words, our daily course of actions in order to establish the correct approach in order to avoid being trapped in a potential pitfall that life puts at every turn. On the other hand, if we focus too much on the outsider life and are distant on our cold with life, with our lives, we may experience reality without any intensity. I have been working on the issues of immigration and borders since 2005. I question my status as an immigrant, as a migrant, expatriate, traveler, and exile. I wouldn't be able to tell you precisely for what reason I pursue this theme. Perhaps I am psychoanalytic analytic process. I'm in a psychoanalytic process to mourn the fragments of my spirit lost in the journey between here and there. I was five or six years old when my father, acting like a smuggler, dropped me off at my grandmother's house without telling me anything of this intention to leave me there. It seems that my father acted on the advice of his family and he did it for good reasons. So it was when I was five or six, I found myself alone next to the loving old lady, my grandmother, Kemayu. Nothing too serious, you would say. Without warning me, my father, just like that, just like a smuggler left me on a platform of a station in the arms of an old woman. From now on, she was going to take charge of instructing me and hand down principles that wouldn't accompany me through my life. In the process of becoming a man, I was then five or six years old, and they say that he had acted simply after having followed the advice of his family. I missed that family like crazy. I live for myself, for my family, this family I barely knew, this family who barely know me, this family I have been looking for all my life without which my life would not be worth living. It was on the weekend in August, my memory tells me. The weather was good and the corn harvest was underway. I also remember that little boy standing in the underpants with his face full of tears, lost in anger. Although he was aware of his helplessness, he stood there determined to try the impossible, hoping that his parents would notice his disagreement with them. But that was wasted effort. At five or six years old, my family disposed, me, disposed of me for personal reasons that I still don't fully understand. My father, who wasn't even a smuggler, had done the dirty job. The creation of another history of borders that would combine experiences of expatriates, migrants, exiles, and the stateless in the collective thing, a sensual, almost loving gesture. It is a work that carries hope, despair at the same time, a revolt that hides a feeling of helplessness. I am going to Calais tomorrow on 20th October 2016 to experience the perpetual movement of the damned which illustrates the eternal class struggle. I am going to Calais tomorrow to convince myself a penultimate pel time that I am not dreaming. Thank you very much and see you soon. Goy, Vote? Yeah. <laughs> there, is, there is no need, as Diono suggests, to take the train, the plane, or the boat to go on a journey. All you need to do is to close your eyes and let yourself be carried away by your imagination. The country we dream of are often 
more beautiful than one than once we discover. Than one did we discover. Uh, it's a fragment of a text. This one is a fragment of a text which have been written in this catalog of an exhibition uh, called the Africa, the Capital Africa, and. Um, I was very, I mean, not really sad, but a bit disappointed by this quote, I mean, by what I just read, actually. There is no need, as Giono suggests, to take a train or plane or the boat to go on a journey. All you need is to close your eyes. I guess when the one who is writing this text says that um, there is no need uh, to do a journey, to go through a journey by plane and so on, is because he has the privilege to experience what is a journey by train, by plane, and so on. So um, it's always very tricky um, to, to say things that way. Um, I, will, I will now um, just try to to go through the images a little bit and explain you, I mean, or uh, discuss with you on how do we make a story, how do we write a story, and um, on doing so, um, what are the materials somehow that we use? Um, the idea of starting to bring this project in the eyes of people in your eyes here uh, by making a book, um, for me, is very important because I, I think that um, on the question of migration, or migra uh, immigration specifically, it is important that we have many perspectives. One of the things that I find during my time in Calais, in the Calais jungle, was that uh, most of the people who were who was running around uh, with the camera, none of them was actually coming from um, from African country or um, or uh, working for for kind of TV pro I mean uh, television uh, group from Africa, which means that most of the images of migration that are consumed in Africa are produced by others, so to say. And um, so it, it really reinforced my, my need to propose something else, to, which was already one of my goals somehow to, while thinking of making this book, um, is like we have to be able to have different perspectives of uh, on history. The question of post-colonial uh, discussion which are going on nowadays in many countries in Europe um, is not just important uh, because uh, we need it, it's also important because it's the way to, em to impact on history as we know it. So um, um, I had this experience in Calais of being the black guy uh, would which is supposed to, who's supposed to be a migrant, but who was carrying camera and running behind the journalist, and the journalist being scared of a black guy running after them <laughs> with camera. So they didn't understand why. So um, it's, it's really, uh, it's also part of my work as, as uh, um, dealing with the, with the performative approach. It's like putting myself in the context where normally I should belong in the other side, but I'm in the wrong side, so to say. Um, the Calais jungle, I spent uh, four, five, it was like five days, very intense, there, and it was the, the five, the four days before the, the dismantlement of the, of the jungle. The whole idea of the French government was that they had to resettle um, uh, all those uh, uh, illegal migrants there uh, in the country, they have to give them a place because uh, it was getting really catastrophic, the condition in which people was, they were, were, were living. And um, 
uh, maybe some of you knows that the Calais jungle started in 2010 and that they tried to dismantle it many times and it just grew bigger and bigger. Um, so at the point where there was kind of, um, there was a question of, I think, six kids missing. is one of the story I hear there. There were six, six kids missing. And then the French government finally decided to, to act um, on what was happening there or to take it seriously because the, the camp was not legal. It was completely illegal. After the, the NGO, I mean, some organization complained that there were kids missing, the French government decided to settle containers, a kind of containers, um, uh, um, uh, how do you say it, a camp, into the camp, in which they decided to remove all the kids with, with, uh, that wasn't in the families, kids and ladies, and they installed them into the containers. So you had a kind of a little privileged space into a contest, into a very chaotic contest, context, uh, with people not being anymore, not having access in and out of this little uh, camp which was made of, out of uh, containers. And actually, people who were living in the container were supposed to be, to feel, or at least to feel, more privileged than people who were, who were living out. So, um, and one thing to remember is that um, um, Calais, actually, specifically in that place where there was this jungle, is considered to be the border of England. It's a bit like Ceuta and Melilla in Morocco. Mm -hmm. So normally, the English police operate in Calais. So they're the ones who filter migration into, uh, 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 into England, into the UK. So I guess the idea of the French government was to let the situation, as it get worse, probably they thought the English part will act on it and nothing happened at the point where it was really just unbearable at the end of the day. Then they had to, to go through it. Um, it's also, I, I, I will also mention that most of the um, uh, NGOs which was that I, which that I found with, that I met some of the volunteers, like on that picture, the volunteers were having their meeting um, uh, uh, into a little cafe called uh, the Baghdad Cafe, into the jungle. And when I say it was really a little city, yeah, you can come around. I mean, it's, 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 it's quite important. When I say it was a little city, uh, it's really the case. You had all into this chaotic environment. People did their best somehow to organize their life. And at the end of the day, when you go, when I went over the idea of being into a camp, I start think about it like being in a, in a downtown uh, somewhere in Cameroon with this picture. You could find it somewhere in Bepanda. You could find really people living in a kind of... Uh, um, bad condition like this somewhere in Cameroon. And in that point, I started making relation with the fact that there was a possibility to just organize Calais as part of uh, the Calais jungle as a part of the city and not moving people from there and send them elsewhere. Ask them if they want to be there and just organize the city in some way to, to get everyone finding its way. But the question of migration is much more complicated than that. It was uh, during the, when this, this was happening, the dismantlement, it was during the, the uh, French campaign, presidential campaign, and you had uh, the, the, this right wing, uh, really extreme right wing lady, Marine Le Pen, going on into the, the, the statistic. So um, there was also this, a, a, a billboard on which you had all the probably the, the the posters of the campaign of Marine Marine Le Pen, which was tear, probably by the migrant or some people, I guess, which which couldn't handle it, um, and uh, that I find it quite uh, funny. And I also decided to include it within the book um, because migration in itself is not just the people who are moving; it's much more. We have to make it to contextualize and put it in perspective, even 
historically, and it, it, makes, it makes more sense to understand it when you look to the history, um, let's say, in the context of Africa with all the colonies back in the days. And if you take the example of Cameroon, for example, uh, uh, when, when you look um, in which condition Cameroon access independency, um, it's very easy to understand that today we have a population who have been traumatized by the so-called independence war, because there was an independence war in Cameroon in which the nationalists, they lost. So the, the people who were fighting in order to have a, a real independence somehow um, and not being in the context of an independence with control of the masters, those people, they lost the war in Cameroon, which means that the government, the state of Cameroon, um, how do you say it? C'est une nation qui a commencé, qui est née en sous état d'urgence. Um, uh, after the the, the 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 how do you say the discourse of the independence of the country, the country directly went under the how do you say the état d'urgence, state state of emergency. The country was run under the state of emergency after the independence, which allowed this, the, the 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 government, which was still control under the control of the old master, which. Which, are, which was the French, which allowed them to kill the rest of the resistance. So we start a country without any perspective, with, with someone, I mean, or let's say uh, with another state dictating the way that the country will be organized. And today it produces a country in which people are just so demotivated. People are People are starving, starving every day with their life. They don't know how to act. They don't know where to start. They're not even able anymore to, to, protect, to protest, to go, on the, to go on the strike on the street. People are very, very scared. They say, uh, you should be careful because you're risking your life. But you tell me, you, you, I just answer like, you're not having any life. There is no life you're risking by going on the street. You, are, you don't have any anymore. So this is the context of the of this uh, um, uh, so-called decolonization. And it, it helps to understand what is happening nowadays with migration, with the need, with the, this, this need to go absolutely. Is to, to, to put it in a kind of metaphor, when, 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 when someone, when you find yourself in the sea, you know that you won't be able to swim until the coast. You have two choices, or you sink, and it's done, or you just say, I will try to swim, hopefully someone took a boat will find me. And this is hap what is happening with most of the immigrants. It's like, oh, you stay in the country, keep on dying, seeing your kids, your, your father is seeing you not having any future, you looking at your kids not having any future, and together you're thinking of the same place. So one person has to act somehow. And um, please forget about the idea that um, Africa is a beautiful continent, uh, it's sun, they have everything, it's green, you have food, you have diamond, you have gold. Forget about it because all of us, we know that. Um, and that's not the point because it's like if, if you have, if you have uh, I mean, let's suppose there is an old, an old man which had lost all his, his teeth and he still have like uh, two, three teeth remain. And you're asking this old man like, don't complain, it's okay, just keep on smiling with the rest of your teeth. There is something wrong there. It's like, uh, don't look at the reality. I mean, you don't have any teeth anymore. You cannot be uh, showing uh, what is not supposed to be a uh, uh, teeth. So this is a bit the case because we, we are also dealing nowadays with the idea that we should show the positive aspect of the continent. And I mean, it's, it's very bizarre. If someone asks you to show what is positive, it's already problematic. It means he's, he's not seeing it. If he's able to see it, he doesn't need to ask you to show it. 
And many, many, in, in the context of the cultural environment and art, art, uh, art scene, they're asking more and more. I mean, it's like on say idea, on say. It's, it's just going around very slowly, like, yeah, those artists, you should try to show the beautiful aspect of the continent. It's, it's fine now. We, we know how it's difficult. We know how you have been. Just show what is nice now. So, and in there, we should remember that there, there have been for the 50 years, the so-called 50 years of independence, there have been, there have been the problem of uh, uh, development cooperation. So Europe have been saying that they are giving money in the continent to help develop. So after 50 years, there is kind of uh, um, belong, how do you say belong in, in English? They're making the belong, making the, 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 the point, trying to see where does the money went during the 50 years, all the money that they have been trying to spend to develop the continent. And they're not able to find where it went, where, where the money went, actually. They, they, they cannot find it. So they have to ask someone or some people to show the positive aspect in order to justify the fact that, okay, the money has been useful somehow. So, But um, I guess... Uh, in, my, in my work with some people who want to show some um, the last three teeth that they have in the mouth, uh, but it won't work with everyone because some people know that you can be shamed and you should be shamed sometimes when, when things go wrong. So it's also it's like the background we need to have when we think about the question of immigration and people really not even risking their life, just taking the last breath that they have to make the last jump in order to, to start it somehow or somewhere. So um, that's uh, one of the points I wanted to, to make here. Back in the, in the Calais jungle, um, here, for example, those are volunteers cleaning the jungle. And you have many situations like this going on. And in this line here, we are, we are having is, um, is a storage of, uh, of, a, of an association where you could come and give staff and they, they, they try to select the staff and go in the jungle to offer it to the migrant. So I really went around in the jungle, but also around in those places uh, where people were acting uh, to see how things was going, to talk with people, to, to also shoot, of course. That there, there as well is also a sweet guy coming from the uh, uh, south of France to help for a few days in the Calais jungle. That dynamic that was happening there, for me, was something very important because it shows that apart from what politicians are saying, about the fact that it's not possible to host everyone, we cannot take the, the whole poverty of the world. There are people here in, this, in those countries in Europe who are ready to make a little space in their life for the other. And this is, is part of the story of migration that people don't tell. In the daily life, many of you, I guess, do their best somehow to make some space or to make it possible to the other to, to find some place to start here. And trust me, most of the migrants, they're very aware that uh, nothing will be given to them for free when they start the trip. They're very aware of it. All this fake idea of migrants looking for, 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 for easy life or just trying to take advantage of this situation, it might happen for certain cases, but you have it everywhere. But it's not true. Uh, none of the migrants move from his house from, 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 from nowhere somehow to arrive in this continent with the idea of living the a life of a retired person. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to live my retired life. I'm going to Europe. If I make it, I'll be living like a retired man. So I have money every month. I do whatever I want to do. We know that even today, most of the people who are retired, they're having difficult time. So it might be very dangerous to expect a, a, a retired, um, to live, to have a life of a retired person. Uh, the other point being in Calais, for me, um, that I find also interesting to look at, it was like, you can see it on those two pictures, 
is the fact that people in the condition of, you know, all the, the dirty which was around, all the, 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 the police provocation in the night. So all around the jungle, before I go back on that story, all around the jungle, you have all those barbers wire that you're seeing around the street on some of the picture. You have it here, you have it there. Uh, you have it there, the, also, yeah, you have it there. In the night, from what I hear from the migrant, but also from the people working for, the, for, to the, uh, for some NGOs and association, in the night, police will shoot tear gas in the camp. Uh, and that I had experienced it here. You have uh, the, 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 the thing, the, the smoke going on is from the tear gas where I've been shot in the night while the migrants are sleeping in the tent. So you, you should just imagine that you're sleeping and suddenly the air is not anymore, you cannot breathe anymore. Police have been doing that in the Calais jungle for some time. And this is really a story that I've been told. And recently again, um, one of the French writer called Jan Moix, he was, he was giving a testimony on it uh, accusing the, the French government of being um, guilty of not uh, um, uh, um, um, uh, respecting the right of the migrant, the human rights, some, 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 some stuff from the human rights. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really, it's really um, living in those situations with all those difficulties. Back in this story, it was very interesting to see that the migrants somehow do their best to reconquer a bit of humanity in their life. You could find a place like this uh, with beautiful decoration, almost settled like, uh, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's I mean, you can be somewhere really in Cameroon or somewhere in Mali where someone just organized uh, the entrance of his house with the two lines of flowers with this pen in front of the door and they will be living inside few of them. From outside, you look at it, you have a little bit of beauty somehow in the context of the fully chaotic uh, uh, situation, not knowing where you're going to be in a few days. So, and you also had that one, which was almost like a kiosk. I'm still in contact. It's only one of the migrants with whom I'm still in contact uh, today. He has been, been settled somewhere around Limoges in France. This one. And uh, I guess um, I will try to keep the contact well and see how it goes for, for him. So um, I think I might stop now. I mean, we can also talk. Uh, and Yeah, just go on. Um, I'm also working as a picture editor in a television station, and we get a lot and a lot of pictures from Calais from all over, mm -hmm. with a lot of faces, and when I... Listen to the people who also work, they say, I want, um, I want to see emotions on TV, I want to see faces, I want to see close-ups. So what's your point of view about that? My, my point with it is that, uh, first of all, I don't consider myself as a photographer. I'm a visual artist who uses photography. So, yeah, 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 and the, 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 that's important, is that um, it's not like... Um, trying to, um, I mean, those people, even in this context, they deserve their intimacy somehow. And uh, my point with it is like uh, um, uh, being there, I'm not just dealing with their reality, it's also part of my reality. So I, I try to make somehow a kind of combination of both of it, um, not forcing them to pose for me and not letting them decide whether I'm making the picture or not. Um, there have been situations in which I, I'm, I'm, I've, I was very scared because um, it's not... Uh, after the trip, most of the people who... I mean, some of the people who ends up in Calais or in Malta or in Lampedusa and so on, Within all those people, there are, there are those who doesn't have any life anymore, who have lost their soul completely. And sometimes <coughs> things can go really wrong. Um, like this picture, 
uh, I find myself in a part of the jungle where normally I was not supposed to go because they told me when I arrived, oh, don't use your camera. Few volunteers with who I was discussing. In this picture, I find myself in, in part of the jungle where I was not supposed to go. And uh, suddenly, the, this guy, the guy that I'm shooting, I, shoot, I just shoot the hand, he bumped into me he, from nowhere, he completely on the drug, completely really like, really in the bad condition. And they asked me, ah, who are you? And he started talking like this. And I, I answered him. I was really scared at that moment. And uh, he said, yeah, take me in photo. And he started opening it close like this. And I said, what's your name? And then he started saying a name. I didn't really get it. I was just like looking around like, okay, I have to get out of here as quick as possible. And um, he was keep on talking, and I was just entertaining the conversation. And he really wanted me to, sh to make a photo of him. And I was like, I, I look at his state, I was like, this is not... I don't, this is not the picture I'm looking for. This is, I don't want to show this, sorry. This, so I, it was just what I said into myself. Then I asked him, can I just show me your hand? Just show me your hand. And then he put his hand there on this mall of sun, and then I showed it. And he was very happy, and he said he came from Gabon, which is just a country above Cameroon. And I said, yeah, I'm from Cameroon. And I was just like, if they find themselves two, three, they might at some moment just say, give me your camera. So then we, I deal with it as quick as I could, and then I get out of there. And it's also part of that reality. So I could make that picture and show it. But that's not, it's not the point. That's not really, it's, what does it say about migration? A guy in that stage, what does it say? It doesn't say that, that much. So it it's really depends... It, there is this pressure of like all the TV company and the newspaper of showing the tragedy in really and the way of creating Emotion. pathos, yeah, 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 to create the pathos into the people. Yeah. Yeah. After this stage, they will have to go into what I call this anonymity, where you, you, you really you overlook that, but at the same time, you don't exist. Um, in, in Belgium, for example, in Antwerp, where I live, where I'm based, uh, also now, uh, the, I had a situation where I saw that the policeman, he was surprised that a black guy shot at him. Because when you're black, you're supposed to be nice with the police. You're scared. You don't know what will happen. I mean, that guy was, the, the two police, they were really surprised. They get out of the car. They, they really like, uh, who is this guy? How come he, he dared to shot at us? I was coming back at uh, school. I went to pick my, my daughter at school at the kindergarten. She was it's still in the kindergarten. And I, I, she, was, she was sitting in back, uh, back of my bike, behind my bike. And I was pushing the bike. And the two police guys, they stopped with the car and tell me, like, uh, you, you don't have any, how do you say it, uh, you don't have any bell for the, for the kids. And I said, but I'm pushing the bike. They say, yeah, but you should have it. I say, I'm pushing the bike here. So it, it, it was just like that. They, they, didn't, they, they didn't realize what would happen. They came out of the car. Yeah, then we will give you a, 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 we will charge you, we will give you a ticket. I say, give it, I will pay for it. And then they write it 120 euro because I was putting my kids. Yeah, that's what happened. So it means that that's what they will have to face is the other step after this one. You know, it's a state where, the, as a migrant, you have to be nice, no matter what is happening to you. You, you have to see how people, <laughs> most of the, the migrant community, in which condition they work, what type of job they accept. Uh, you know, it, it's just uh, unbearable as a, as a condition. So uh, in, that's the sense that is, is in that sense that I'm talking about taming anonymity. It's very important to know that as a human being, no matter who you're dealing with, as far as you know what you're talking about, you better stand right into it. It's really, you better say it as good as you can and as strong as you should. So um, it's, it's really, uh, I mean, that's kind of my point with, with the question of uh, anonymity somehow. Uh, being recognized by the police, that's one thing, but... Um, it would it always happen 
uh, it always happens. If you're not recognized, you will have to face a situation like the one I'm talking about. Uh, there is a two entity here. There is me as an uh, artist or photographer, and there is him. So it means that I, made my, I have to make my own choices as well. He's not the one decided on picture that I made. He don't say photograph me. He, he's not paying me for that. <laughs> so he cannot say photograph me and then I just go on and photograph him. I, 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 I select what I photograph as actually. And later on I select again what I'm going to show. Uh, and that's, that's just uh, my point with it. Is, is like, uh, it's a position to assume... Um, uh, not just in terms of risk, because everything can happen, but also in terms of uh, ethic. Uh, each of us has his own relation to ethic. And I personally, as a human being, I have mine. And uh, working with my camera is really something I'm very much aware of it. Uh, sometimes I photograph people who doesn't want to be photographed. There's one picture here. It's a volunteer. Where is him? Um, He's, he's, they are giving stuff. No, it's not uh -huh. here. Yeah, here. Here. Look, look behind. Yeah, look at that man behind. He's saying no. But then I keep on going. I just make the photo. So there are the situations like that as well, where you say no, but I make the photo, because I'm the one who decides as well. It's not just you who decides. Behind there, you have the guy. One on the yeah. On the, on the no, 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 he. he the, big, the big guy. He's yeah. saying no, no, no. He's walking to me, actually, like that. No, no, don't do the photo. But oh, I'm doing the photo. Sorry. So um, it's it's is it it's really because, hmm? because you approach them. The project is an artist and not as a photo journalist. I didn't have I didn't have to explain to everyone that I photograph <coughs> that I'm an artist. Mm -hmm. To few of them, I did explain that. But most of them, they were just they were just looking at me like, who is? This? Most of them, they also thought I was a migrant, but they were very surprised. What are you doing with camera? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yes, well, why, why, how come? You, you're running around with camera as well. Um, um, and uh, talking about, I mean, um, it's, it's a very complex part of it. Uh, I'm still working on the sound footage of my journey in Calais. There was this man, he's very known in Calais jungle. He was the guy running the running kitchen in Calais. I don't know, I probably have one of the pictures. People are queuing for the food. Uh, yeah, that's it. Kitchen in Calais. This, this guy, a very great man, actually. He's, he's, he, he, was, he, he settled with his wife. He told, me, he told me the story. He said they arrived in Calais, his wife and him. He, they arrived in Calais, and uh, they were supposed to be there just for... No, I don't. So he said he arrived in Calais with his wife, he came to give some stuff, to bring some stuff to the NGOs who, who are there working, who was there working for the, to, 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 to help the migrant. And he was supposed to spend two days. And after the second day in the jungle, he met a kid, a little girl or boy, I don't remember, who was, who was alone. And he said he didn't want to his wife and him, they said they didn't want to let the kids alone, so they wanted to take care and make sure that the kids go with uh, an association or with someone. So they spent again one day, one night, and uh, the, the, the fourth day, they lost their ticket to take the ferry back in the UK. And then they called they call a friend uh, uh, in the UK and explained the thing and asked if the friend could help. So the friend sent them a camping car so they had a camping car, they settled the little girl in it. So it's a really a beautiful story. But then, more you listen to the story, more it gets a bit complicated, which is also what is happening with most of the NGOs. I'm almost like a bit, I don't know if I should really tell the story because he's a very sweet guy. Um, you have some of his picture on the internet. If you dial on Facebook, Kitchen in Calais, you will find it. And he was the one running Kitchen in Calais. What happened with the time is that he, he found a place for the little girl, as he said, and then um, they, they managed to, to have this, with the camping car, they managed to start giving one foot for some of the migrants, and they, 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 they make a large communication 
uh, into the milieu, so they had many friends trying to help, and then they stopped the so-called project Kitchen in Calais, and uh, suddenly they start having help uh, from people, you know, like they ask their friend, and their friend asks their friend, yeah. <laughs> and suddenly they start having help coming from Yemen, mm -hmm. coming from uh, Libya, they start having help coming, so they were... <laughs> So when you listen to the story, and suddenly uh, he, he, he had a big uh, batch, in batch, how do you say, a tent, a really big tent, <laughs> larger than this uh, place. He set it as a mosque. So he became the guy who was running the mosque. So finally, people who were coming to have food, they were first having to go to the mosque. I haven't prayed in the mosque, I was in the mosque, we prayed in the mosque together. They had to go in the mosque. And then when they come out, they queue to have the, the food, actually. So you, you, you start to see how a good idea at the beginning, and some sweet guy can suddenly be someone that can be manipulated or can be a center of something where things can go wrong. I mean, he could just rise people or, or, or put a dogma to people. He, he, he had the power. He became really a central figure. So which is also all the complexity of migration that uh, uh, that you had in the context of Calais, just in the Calais jungle, you have all this complexity of the of the situation of uh, migration. So um, there, there there are a lot of lot of story to be told. Uh, so that's a bit also the story talking about my personal process. That's the how I wrote I write about it into this uh, little booklet, actually. It's really a mix of intimate and public, um, somehow, which, which made my, 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 the, the, my vision or the way I looked at this question of migration. When I'm there, there is really no relation, no, no distance between them and me, unless, if we put it in terms of at the professional level, in terms of uh, artists, photographer, yes, there is a difference. There is me and them. But at the human level, there is no difference. And as in my work, both of them, they mix, mix as he said. Uh, they really mix. Uh, the way I live is the way I do my art, uh, is the way I interact with people, and so on. Um, uh, it's not the first time I'm traveling within a camp. Uh, here in the Calais jungle, it was somehow uh, a kind of open camp. When I went in, the Mal in Malta uh, to visit, uh, to, to also to visit some of the closed centers for migrants, those which, uh, I mean, the prison for people who decide to immigrate, they call it closed center, and then later there are open centers, but it's a prison. So once you get in Europe illegally, you go first in prison, and then uh, is um, is how uh, they prepare you to become a European. They first put you in prison, and later on they're expecting you to be a perfect European. So that's what happens. So and later we're surprised with what is happening. Uh, we should really be careful with uh, all what is going on in relation to the so-called foreign communities. There are a lot, a lot to be said about it. Um, so I went in Malta and I also visit uh, migrant camp, closed centers, and I could just easily get in because I'm a black guy and I was not dressed with suit. I could just walk in and out. They, they won't even realize that uh, I wasn't one of those guys looking for paper. So, and it was the same when I went to the open centers. I was discussing with the guy, and there, that was completely another experience. There were some of the migrants, they were so surprised seeing me there with camera, discussing with them, spending the whole day there. They were like, don't you have something else to do with your money? I mean, <laughs> why are you here? You're not a journalist. You say you're an artist, but I mean, you can go and photograph some beautiful landscape in Africa. They will like it here. So why are you here? So there was always, and for me, a, that's where the performative <laughs> aspect of it happen. It's not just at the personal level, it's also into this relation to the other. Then there starts another type of conversation in which I'm sure I never get myself understood. I cannot explain to the guy that, uh, yes, I was living in Holland at that moment, I had everything paid, I had uh, all the insurance, 
I traveled there without taking any appointment with any ONG, and I just came there to do that, to do some photographs that still I didn't even use. Actually, most of the footage that I have from Marta, I didn't use it. With Kale, I'm trying to make it different because I also find out that, of course, I make the choice to work on the question of migration, to visit the camp, but I cannot always like just uh, keep it on my own because the possibility hasn't happened yet to show it. Uh, all the footage from the, uh, uh, the so-called 10 village in Malta, they're still uh, with me. Most of, there are only few friends who have looked at it. So I thought with Calais it would be good at least to start with the book. That's also where the idea of making a book to spread it out, to put it into a sharing environment with people. That's where the idea came, actually. So I guess if you have any question, we can go to it or have, have we keep on going. Room. Yes. How, how long did you spend there? Five Four days, days, I think. Four days. I leave the fifth day because, I mean, they, were, they start to remove everything. Okay. And since I wasn't a journalist, I didn't have any card. I couldn't access the camp anymore. So the police had blocked everything. And so uh, I just do, I did a few pictures at the entrance and when the bus were coming out of the jungle with people, and then I left. My beloved, some truths are very hard to hear and the way we experience them does not make them more tolerable, even though we experience them. The jungle of Calais is one of them. The night will not be long and it is better that way. It will be a miserable battle but it will be a battle anyway. It is only 8 p.m. and the first movements of the police made me understand that, even if the game is over from a political point of view, those who are abandoned to their fate will not accept to remain passive. They are about a thousand men belonging to 19 companies of the CRS, riot police, who are on duty from the 17th to the 27th of October, 2016. Armed men clear armed men to clear some 5,000 homeless away, whose only fault is their will to cross the channel. Those to whom Europe and its neighbours, by means of their dehumanising international policies, refuse the right to reinvent a future for themselves, to rebuild a home, a life, to regain some dignity whilst feeling free. In a so-called democratic land, this will remain a violation of the highest order made to democracy by democratic means, which will remain in living memory. Illegal immigrants are not welcome, no matter what the Articles 13, 14 and 15 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights stipulate. In today's world, the political morass, be it on the left or on the right, organises the removal of migrants by discussing practical arrangements with NGOs. It is as if migrants were suddenly stricken with Alzheimer's and had nothing to say regarding their demands respect for their fundamental rights, with no choice other than being represented by a third party. The state, under the guise of discussions with human rights associations, loads thousands of migrants and asylum seekers, whether they like it or not, moving them to more, u more suited destinations, we are told. Who would have believed that? On this day, the 23rd of October 2016, I saw the police forces fire tear gas on unarmed migrants. The police fired tear gas several times in the Calais camp, with tents tightly pressed up against one another, and often in pools of stagnant water, which were harbouring the outcasts of the frontier posts. Who would have believed that is a naive question when we know what the border guards do in Suenta and Melilla, in Morocco and in Spain when we know what militias and smugglers do in Libya and the Mediterranean. Who would have believed that is a very naive exclamation when we have seen the xenophobic attacks on migrants in South Africa in 2008, when we know that at the border between the United States and Mexico, border guards shoot and kill migrants who illegally cross over the walls of fences and barbed wire. A few days ago, when I arrived in the jungle, some people I met told me that sometimes at night, Sleeping migrants are victims of police provocations. Others told me they found they had found migrants that had suffered second degree burns in fires caused by explosions of tear gas at night on the tents in the jungle. I admit that at first I was skeptical about these stories that seemed so surreal and full of emotions. 
but tonight, past 9pm, I can see and hear detonations of shots and explosions of tear gas that will fall on the tents and shacks in the jungle. Despite the unrest due to tension among migrants who do not want to leave the place, many of them retired to their tents where they hope to get some sleep before the long day of, of 24th October that lies ahead. I am not a journalist, let alone a reporter. I've never experienced war and have rarely attended or participated in demonstrations that escalated into clashes with the police. I cannot stand violence, scenes of violence, and yet during my adolescence in Cameroon, I lived in a permanent state of alert. The political imbalance, combined with the repression of all dissenting voices, plus the attempts of aborted revolts of the people have created a climate of general mistrust. In Cameroon we were all afraid of anyone and everything, and yet our lust for life and our desire to succeed are evident in our ability to undertake, create, and develop projects that are born and die on a family basis on a daily basis. In Cameroon, the so-called scenes of popular justice that often end with the killing of the, of the accused have always bruised me. For how can we convince an unleashed mass of the importance of referring to justice, even if it is corrupt, in order to ascertain the guilt and fate of the accused? Africa is beautiful and rich, but the conditions of survival force us to think of immigration as the last remaining hope. Here, in the jungle, a large majority of migrants were aware of the difficulties they would encounter by leaving their country. They knew that the likelihood of succeeding was slim. They did not come to Europe to live the life of a pensioner. They hoped to be in a peaceful place. They looked to settle, to learn new skills, to find a job and to earn money to care for themselves and their families. In the West, the feeling of security due to the development and to a social organization allowing the most deprived to have access to the basic services necessary for their well-being, did not even enable the eradication of the structural racism hindering the daily life and positive development of the citizens of the diaspora. How to oppose the state? On what basis should we have dialogue with politicians who allow the propagation of discrimination, racism and all the systems of domination over minorities? As I was running with sore eyes to get away from the smoke of the tear gas that had just exploded, I realised that these stories I had heard about police attacking migrants at night were certainly not invented. I understood what kind of hell, what kind of hell it is to be trapped in his own dream, a, and prisoner of a camp encircled by the police, prisoner of the toxic smoke from the tear gas, and prisoner of the fire on his own tent. In a land of human rights, a migrant camp that has been illegal for years is now asphyxiated with tear gas. Who would have believed that? In a country that med mediated the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I had the feeling today to see with my own eyes, and no longer on television, a confrontation between the over-equipped Israeli army and the young stone-throwing Palestinians. In short, let's say that all this is just the commonplace story of a beaten man who, one day, unites the little courage and dignity that remains in him and takes the road to exile. This long and perilous journey cost him all his savings and deprived him of the last bit of dignity he still had. Nevertheless, our beaten man finally arrived at a place where he was hoping to find a moment of respite. But his efforts had been in vain because the first person to whom he confided went to denounce him immediately and our beaten man was sent back to the, mar to the marital home from which he had escaped. The same evening, he was, starred, st he, was, he was stared at after a large smack that his partner gave him as a punishment for dreaming of a future without beatings. I think of you. See you soon. Guy Vuete Postscriptum Dad told me that we were going to visit Grandma. I had followed him with enthusiasm and joy, hoping that I would spend a wonderful weekend with him and my grandmother. How naive I have been. 